Okie dokie. Here we go. Um, good morning, hello, and welcome to Games and Culture for today. Um, just kind of getting some things set up here still. It's kind of a, a weird spot on my green screen sometimes. I'm trying to, trying to eliminate that if I can. And, um, yeah, it's still there. There's a little bit of sunlight coming in through the crack there. I just needed to try to <laughs> tone that down a bit. Um, yeah, I still, I don't know. I always get like nitpicky about my, um, the lighting on me. I feel like I, I look sort of washed out in pink today. <laughs> um, I assure you I'm feeling fine. I'm not feeling particularly washed out or pink, uh, but that's just what this is doing to me. Um, anyway, let me turn this down. Turn down the background music. And I'll be getting started a little slowly here, or gradually, I suppose, to give people a chance to get online. There's only a handful of people on Discord and in stream at the moment, so I'll give people a minute to get on um, just in case they're on their way. Um, I guess if people are wanting to watch this after the fact, that's acceptable as well. Um, but I hope to have at least a, uh, a chunk of you on today so I can actually, um, because I was, what I was hoping to do with part of today's lecture is actually um, make it a little bit interactive in the sense that, um, I, I mean, I'd like to pose some questions and then see if you can answer them in, in, uh, in the uh, Discord chat. So I don't know. I mean, that's something that's kind of natural to do if we're lecturing in person, but um, a little awkward to do online sometimes, but I thought we'd try it. It's something that it can work. So <laughs> I thought I would try it here. So good morning. Good morning, everyone. Jillian, Scott, Maddie, Kate, Beck. Uh, see you all in Discord. So thanks for saying hello and uh, Colin on Twitch. That's fine. Um, and Colin, you just you posed a question about another teacher um, rating the class, and I, I don't I certainly don't mind if anyone watches and participates in chat. That's totally fine, um, as long as they're not being distracting or disruptive. Um, but I don't know what you mean by raid, because there is the idea of like a raid in Twitch, like where you take over someone else's channel, and um, I think I've disabled that on my Twitch. So I don't think that's going to happen. At least I don't think it can happen. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but um, in any case, all are welcome to watch. That's why I put it out there. It's all public. It all goes on Twitch. It all goes on YouTube. Um, even the uh, the Canvas course is set to public. So I, I like to put things out there, right? I mean, it's something that uh, as a teacher, I benefit from looking at other people's, other teachers' classes and the material that they put online. So I likewise, um, you know, I, I pay it forward. I like to put what I put together um, I, I like to put what I put together what I I like to put what I've done <laughs> out there <laughs> to help other people um, yeah so I don't know if I'm not I, yeah I know that's what that is I know what a twitch rate is Colin I'm just wondering if that's what you meant by someone rating my channel I don't really want anyone to rate my channel <laughs> if that's what you mean um, but uh, anyway uh, let's uh, just because I, I mean I have I'm using it for a very specific purpose right now Anyway, um, I hope you're all doing well. I uh, hope you all um, had a chance to kind of catch up or on, you know, relax a little bit with a slightly longer weekend um, honoring uh, Martin Luther King holiday uh, yesterday. And I, uh, I used that time, I, uh, I played some anti-racist games on my Twitch stream. A couple people were watching, I don't know if that was you all. Um, but uh, that was interesting and I, there's a lot to explore in that area. Um, and it's the kind of thing that I would like to learn more about. Um, I played like um, several games basically I don't want to go back through it all but uh, you can watch it if you want it's not required um, but there was something that I did put out in canvas yesterday you might not have seen so I wanted to kind of talk about that and a couple other things um, that are coming up uh, today and uh, this week um, this week is kind of weird so um, I mean there all three of these weeks have been kind of weird um, and this one I'm still trying to figure out um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of how little time we have left and how much I still want to try to accomplish. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like I painted myself into a particular box and I'm still trying to figure out if we can still do everything that I hoped for. Um, so let me know, I mean, I will let you know as soon as I figure these things out. My hope is to cover two more, two topics today, two pretty major topics today, two more tomorrow, and then a third on um, 
Thursday. And then that would be kind of the last lecture with content. Yeah, well, no, sorry, I thought of the fourth. <laughs> so uh, another one. So anyway, um, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to play with the schedule. If you look in in Canvas, the module right now is still pretty much a skeleton. So I'm I'm still trying to figure out what I can put where. Uh, but today the plan is to talk about um, video game, I call it ontology, but that's not really the right word. Um, ontology is the study of being, and I'm not really talking about ontology in the context of video games. I'm just really talking about what games are. Uh, that's going to be the first lecture for today. And then in the second lecture for today at 1.30, uh, I hope to, I hope it'll, I can keep it shorter, but I want to talk about ludology and narratology, which are two competing points of view in the early days of video game studies as an academic discipline. So I want to talk about that and those two fields and their, their um, disagreements between each other. Um, but let me actually show you a couple things in Canvas first before I get into anything with slides. Um, the, uh, this is actually, I'll go ahead and put it on the slide. This is the, the plan, the outline for today and also kind of looking ahead uh, a bit in terms of what you need to be keeping in mind and working on and working toward. Um, but I'll show you a couple of these, these things as well. So I, whoops, I don't need that. Um, where am I? Here we are. Uh, okay, cool. So this is week three and this is the plan for today. Um, you may not have seen it. So I, um, because I put it in Canvas and Canvas does send a notification for new discussion pages, but uh, it occurred to me later that um, depending on your settings, like your notifications and your Canvas settings, it may or may not have actually sent you a notification about discussions. Like I have that on by default, but you may not. Um, I hope you have it set to notify you about announcements, but discussions are optional as an announcement or as a notification setting. Anyway, I'm linking it now and you can access it now. Um, this is a, a reading discussion page and it actually might be easier for you to complete it after today's lecture. I mean, I, that's also reasonable. Um, so this is a schedule with the links in it. Uh, the thing that the discussion I was referring to is this one here. So if you go on the before class, um, I set this as due yesterday, but it means obviously you can still do it. And, and please do because it, it will help you understand these kinds of things a little bit more deeply. Um, I'm really just kind of working through chapter three of the textbook, and that's what most of today's talk is. Um, so take a look at that yourself, and there's obviously going to be a little bit more discussion and nuance and context in the textbook than, than what I can give you uh, verbally here. So take a look at these, and really I'm just asking you to pick one and summarize their point of view. And so it looks like a couple of you have already done that, so that's great. Uh, everyone else, please do that as well. Um, this will help you kind of understand the significance of different points of view and what they have to contribute to our, our bigger picture of what video games are and, and why, you know, why it's important to talk about them in different ways sometimes. Um, so uh, check that out. If you have any questions, let me know, but basically just post something there. It's a place to have an asynchronous kind of uh, discussion. So please do that. Um, in fact, I wanted to make a slight change to that. Uh, I think I had it set so you have to post something before you can read other people's replies, but it occurred to me that it doesn't really make sense. So let me uncheck that box. Come on, stop jumping around. There we go. There we go. <laughs> so that's going to be, yeah, so now you can see the other replies just to kind of have an idea of what sort of thing people are doing for this one. Um, so check that out. Please do that. The other one, if you look at it, I've also made another one uh, for today, and this one's going to be something to do after the lecture today. I mean, you could start now if you really want to, but um, I'll, and I'll add links into this here. Um, but there's two things I'd like for you to read. Uh, one is an essay by Espen Arseth, and the other is an essay by uh, Mary La Ryan. And these are two thinkers on either side of the conversation, ludology versus narratology, and they're staking their claims and, and, and arguing for their positions. Uh, so I'd like for you to read both of those and then do a bit of compare and contrast and I've got some kind of leading questions to prompt you to think more deeply about what's going on in these essays and what they mean, uh, what their significance is in the broader field of video game studies. So um, uh, check that out. The, the links are in today's notes already and I'll add those links also to the reading journal just to make them uh, easier to find if you need to. Uh, but yeah, check that out uh, after the lectures today because part of what I have to talk about will help you understand those better, I hope. Uh, but, so. I mean, um, yeah, and, and obviously this today's notes are still pretty much um, pretty minimal, but I will be adding to them. Uh, okay, so uh, other things, a lot of other things are going on. Uh, the metagame project, um, I think I will probably just barely have time to introduce metagaming today. Um, so um, it may seem kind of challenging to have the project due tomorrow. 
I think it still can be done tomorrow, so I'm gonna leave it there. But of, of course, like anything, if you need to, to take an extra day on it, if you need an extension on it, um, you don't even have to ask, just go ahead and take it. Like, that's fine. Um, but I'm gonna leave it as due tomorrow just to kind of keep the sequencing and the schedule. And uh, of course, I'll talk about it um, maybe today, but hope definitely tomorrow. And uh, that'll be your main homework tomorrow, if that makes sense. Um, okay, and then the final project uh, is due at the end of the week, as well as the weekly reflection and the final grade proposal. Um, so I'll, of course, have plenty more to say about those, both of those things, but just to remind you about the weekly reflections, um, still missing some from week one, although I got a couple more, so thanks for submitting those. Uh, missing a few more for week two, um, and of course week three is just getting started, so you can't reflect on week three yet. Um, I, and I recorded videos for you all to give you feedback on your work from week one. And in those videos, um, I hopefully explained what I'm hoping for in these reflections. So if you need to go back and redo week two or add to it, then you might you know, go, go ahead and do that. Um, these essentially act in terms of kind of the learning goals of the class. These fill the place of an exam or a quiz uh, because you know I put a ton of content out in the lectures and then I wanna see in these reflections that you can summarize some of what I've Put out there so that you know you you're showing me that you understand it um, and then on top of that i also hope that you have your own ideas and insights uh, that you can add on top of that summary so it's not just you repeating what i've told you but you coming up with your own interpretations and ideas and that's what i hope to see in those reflections so they're kind of open-ended i mean they're very open-ended obviously um, but they do actually serve a pretty important purpose in the overall goals for the class so uh, make sure you do those um, put some thought into it, and um, you know, hopefully, I'll be able to see that in the that work. If you want to write it or record a video, that'd be fine. Either one's fine. Um, a couple of you did videos, and that works. Obviously, I kind of like doing videos, so I kind of get the uh, the appeal. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> I had to um, I had to just checking outside. There's there was a lot more action in the yard this morning. I saw a lot of birds. I heard a lot of the birds singing uh, around sunrise, and. Um, they're still kind of hanging out over there, though. I saw um, uh, there's a, a pair of uh, cardinals that live in the yard, I think, or, or nearby, and so I see I see them usually every morning. I did see them today, and it looked to me like they were kind of checking out my new bird feeder, but they were not getting very close to it. I have seen them, like one day when I was installing it, um, or installing the camera part of it, I was over there working, and uh, the female cardinal like flew in and almost like hit me in the head because she was she didn't expect me to be there, so um, she was flying into my new feeder but I was in her way and she kind of freaked out. So I think she might be, I might have scared her off. She might be wary of this feeder now that I accidentally scared her. But um, hopefully she'll come back and give it another chance. I, I built a little box for the camera. So the camera is sort of camouflaged now. Um, it's a little box, it looks like a bird feeder, um, but uh, the hole in the side is, is the lens uh, as opposed to an actual hole. And then it's like I painted sort of a camouflage pattern on it. So. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't actually know how good bird eyesight is, so I don't know like what their whether that will make a difference. But you know, we'll find out. And I've got the bird came up on the stream here. Um, it's positioned in such a way that I can't actually see it very well. So if you happen to see a bird fly in there, please let me know so I can check it out. Um, okay. So here's today's lecture. We're going to be talking about ludology, um, narratology later on. But for now, uh, we are talking about definitions and boundaries. And we're drawing some lines, and we're looking at how different people have drawn lines. We've already looked at this question of how to define a game and how to define video games, and we're still doing that. Um, I think there's still some benefit here because these, uh, the background that I'm going to provide in some of these slides here has to do with um, not just video game studies, but philosophy, anthropology, history, sociology, uh, psychology. These are different disciplines where people have made definitions or claims about games and play. Uh, that have turned out to be pretty influential and citable, like things that you can reference in your own writing. Um, and these different positions have different values and assumptions embedded in them. And I think it's important to understand those and try to unpack those because whenever we want to say serious and scholarly things about video games, you know, it helps to build those statements on top of uh, other people's statements. And we've got lots of examples. And uh, basically, I'm just I'm literally working through the examples in chapter three of the textbook. Um, I'm going to refer to their structure I think I think it's helpful but the issue I do have a couple well you may notice a theme as I work through these and you'll maybe I'll ask you if you notice that theme after I'm done um, and then then we can talk about it so let me see I saw a question just now um, yes I did share them earlier Kelly they're up there if you scroll back you should be able to see them uh, okay so that's and in fact these would be 
these slides probably would be easier to read on your own as opposed to me kind of talking through them because I'm going to put them on screen, but there's a lot of text on these. So, you know, bear with me as I work through it. Um, okay, so this is actually a long quote from the textbook, and I kind of liked the way they framed this. This is their framing of chapter three in the textbook, basically answering the question of like, what's the point of staking out different positions? Like if we have, you know, we know we all know what video games are, we can play them, we all kind of know what games are. Like what's the point of coming up with a more serious philosophical definition or answer to that question, what is a game, what is play? And I think they have a good point here, and I I, um, I agree with it. I mean, so they're saying there's there's two, there's actually two claims embedded. I wish I could highlight this text without, because I know if I click on it, it'll advance, but two claims I think are really important. Um, if we consider games to be stories, we will focus on rather different things than if we consider games to be drama systems or types of play, right? So that's one, that's what they're signaling right there is the fundamental tension in the the so-called debate between ludology and narratology, which we'll get to later. Um, I, I think that's interesting and important, but I kind of, I view that as almost an aside in this particular explanation. Um, I think the next sentence actually is a much more important point, which is that the challenge here is not so much to find the correct perspective, but rather to be aware of uh, and explicit about the assumptions we make. And I think that's much more important. And I think that's also the biggest challenge. Like um, I do come from a literary background, like academically, I was an English major, philosophy major, and then I went to school and got my PhD in a literature program. So uh, these are things that I, that that's my background, right? I mean, that, and that informs the set of assumptions that I make when I study a video game. Um, it's the, it informs the kinds of things I look for and the kinds of things that jump out to me as important. Um, and so I think understanding that that's part of my background and that's also, you know, uh, built into the assumptions I'm making about games uh, is important, but that's a different set of assumptions and backgrounds that, that someone else may have. And so it's important to be able to talk about where I come from in order to understand where other people come from and make sure that we're talking about the same thing uh, when we look at a video game. So um, let's kind of work through some of these. And I have, what I've done is I've gone, I've gone through the chapter and I've pulled out um, a few key quotes from different thinkers that they talk about in the chapter to give you a sense of them. I've also included pictures because I think sometimes a picture, like putting a face with a name, with a quote sometimes, at least for me, helps kind of anchor an idea in my mind and understand it a little bit better. Um, so this is Wittgenstein, Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein. And I don't know, he's actually, an, it's an, he's an odd place to start for this chapter, I gotta say, because he's, his statement about games is almost um, dismissive. Like he's essentially saying that um, I don't know what games are, uh, except that they do seem to have family resemblances among them, although I'm not really sure what those are or what those mean. Like he almost declines to define it. Um, it is important though within his his philosophy though. I mean, so so Wittgenstein was a philosopher, and um, he he one of his key ideas that people reference from him is this idea of language games, and he it, so for him a game is an important conceptual structure that is his way of describing what language is like. So he's ultimately talking about language, but using games as almost a metaphor to talk about language. Therefore, he does need to try to define what games are first. And that's where we get this definition that he kind of gives us and kind of declines to give us, um, where he says, we kind of know what they are, but it's so many different kinds of things. It's just, it's just too hard to say what that, uh, what that is. Uh, which I think is a shame. I think he could say a lot more with it. Uh, for him, he's working within like other writers and thinkers at the same time, and er, like the first half of the 20th century, um, and, and going into um, kind of the post-structural, post-modern era, were using language as a construct to understand culture and and psychology and all kinds of things. So for his contribution to that conversation, his idea is that a language is a kind of game. It's a set of rules. It's a playing field in which we operate, and we share a set of uh, terminology and values and um, uh, communication operations that we can use with and against each other and it kind of creates this sort of playing field that defines everything else. Uh, but for him he's trying to view language as a game not so much using you know defining the game itself if that makes sense at all. Yeah I think and Kelly's right I mean that's I think that's kind of it and I, but I think it's actually kind of helpful because it illustrates the challenge right it's something that you kind of can be disappointed in Wittgenstein, but it's like, okay, but what is it? Like, how would you go next? How would you go further, right? So Wittgenstein, I kind of understand why he had a hard time going further because it's really kind of hard to say. So um, let's look at some people who did go further and tried to uh, explain these things. So um, yeah, Johan Huizinga is probably the most influential, um, maybe after maybe 
maybe tied with Roger Kaiwa, who's the next slide, but um, his concept of play is probably the most influential in the study of game studies, uh, I would say, maybe, at least for me. Um, so, and I'll show you why, because he gives us a really convenient icon for understanding his theory of what play, uh, what play means and how it works. So his, the title of his seminal work is Homo Ludens, and he means that as like a sequel to um, Homo Erectus, Homo Sapien, Homo Ludens. So Homo Ludens is man, the player. And for, uh, this is a quote from his book, um, uh, for, for Heusinger, play is the defining element that characterizes culture. Um, so humans exist in societies and civilizations, and we have uh, structures like religion and government and family, and each of these can be characterized in some sense as a form of play. Um, and they follow the structural patterns of play. Um, so for him, play comes first. Play precedes culture. Uh, play is something that humans had to figure out how to do before they were able to figure out how to have society, civilization, um, and everything else that goes with it. Um, so for him, it's a really important uh, I guess, uh, evolutionary, adaptational kind of thing that humans figured out. Um, so he's, he's talking about, but he, at the same time, he also talks about play as something that animals do. So that's kind of his evidence is that we can see animals playing and that is kind of the building block that humans started with, but then became, um, you know, everything else. So in, in terms of play, think, if you can think of, if you've ever seen two dogs, you know, playing, you can, you can see how in some ways what they're doing uh, if you don't know the dogs, you don't know how dogs do this, um, it looks like fighting, right? I mean, they're sort of, you know, rolling around on the ground and snarling and stuff. Um, but dogs do that as a way to negotiate their relationship and also just to, just maybe for fun, I don't know. But they're really not trying to hurt each other. And if you look at how they bite, they bite in ways that it do doesn't injure each other. It's just how they kind of, how they play. And so um, that's one of his examples. Uh, but one of the consequences of thinking through play as a structure and then looking for that structure everywhere else is that um, you can find it everywhere else. And so we've got a few examples here. Uh, this is a paragraph from his discussion of religion and ritual. So think of all of the um, kinds of playing that happen in a religious context. Um, and so this, I mean, this might seem kind of controversial, so, you know, go with me, but he's talking about, um, if you think of how in, so like in the Protestant tradition, um, I'm Presbyterian, so in, in our Protestant tradition, when we take communion, uh, we pretend that the host and the wine is the flesh and blood of, of Christ. Like, we don't literally believe it, but that dis difference between how we believe what that means uh, is how we distinguish ourselves from Catholics. And so if you're a Catholic, you have a different set of rules that govern the significance of the uh, ritual of communion. Um, but think of all the other rituals that, that that happen like um you know like baptism like uh like liturgy uh, these are things that where we have a special set of rules that apply in that space um, but also that space could be different places the space is almost secondary to the act of ritual just to, to the agreement that we all make that this for right now this bread means something more than just bread and it's like a, a game we're playing um, that this is this is meaning, and it's a it's a symbolic meaning. Just like in checkers, um, a black disc is a uh, a soldier or something. It's not a black plastic disc. It has a meaning in the context of the game, and it's that idea of entering into that that space and that time where that meaning matters. That's what we recognize as play. So that's. Um, yeah, right. So it does have that. Uh, you could you could characterize it that way, Jack. Yes, um, but it's pretend, and that's the point: is that it's pretend, right? And it's a kind of playing. Um, he also makes the the idea that Hoisinger also talks about um, uh, war as a kind of game. There are rules to war, and uh, certainly politics. There are rules to politics, and there's a way of gaming politics or thinking about politics as a kind of zero-sum game. Um, I mean, these are things that become pretty persuasive and pervasive if you start looking for it everywhere, right? And if you start looking for it, you will start seeing it, in other words. So uh, the key sort of thing that, that we can take from Huizinga is this idea or the image of the magic circle. And he talks about this circle wherein the rules obtain. That's the phrase he uses. So that's where it matters. Um, you can think of this as a literal space, like if you're playing soccer and you're in bounds and you're a player, 
um, it makes a big difference if you pick up the ball with your hands, right? You're not allowed to do that if you're not a player, um, if you're not a goalie, rather. So, but anywhere else, it doesn't matter. You pick up the ball with your hands, no, it doesn't matter. It only matters once you enter into the magic circle, or I guess in that case, the magic rectangle of the soccer field. Um, that's when that particular thing matters. And it's that ability to step out of our normal world into this temporary world with special rules that defines play and evolutionary, our evolutionarily speaking, our ability to do that is what sets us apart. And that's, you know, what, what we end up uh, defining. So, yeah, he talks here about the temple. He talks about um, the tennis court, the turf, um, this idea of marking out space and time. And he, he, he's using the term sacred here, but he's thinking about how we, how we go into that space. So I think it's a really a, a fairly pervasive and interesting idea. Um, and specifically, this is a question I'm going to pose to you, and you're welcome to answer it in the, the uh, Discord there. Uh, if we can, can think of school and education like a game, and I think we can in many ways, what are some? What are its boundaries, and what are some of its features? Like, what are some of the special rules? What are some of the special things that we um, pretend are true while we're in an educational context? Uh, how does that? How does that um, help you? Like, in other words, how can we apply his idea of the magic circle to think about a classroom? And I mean classroom in the metaphorical sense as well. So I'll let you type if you, I'm gonna, I need to blow my nose. I'll be right back. I'm back. <laughs> okay. uh, so, yeah. <laughs> All right, good. Um, okay, good. Interesting examples. Let me comment on a few of these. Grading systems are definitely boundaries, Maddie. I'd, I'd like to uh, hear you say more about that if you want to. Um, but that's uh, absolutely. Uh, it's a it's a rule in which we pretend that the completion of an assignment has a kind of um, fungibility to it, to use an economics term. Uh, the idea that it, it becomes a sort of commodity that can be exchanged for a grade, right? I mean, that's a, like, that's all arbitrary. Like, that doesn't actually mean anything real. Um, yeah, scheduled times, definitely. Uh, boundaries to different things, work, play, and eating, uh, especially elementary, you know, K-12 education. Good idea. Yeah, and Kelly, I like that one too, Kelly, uh, that Wikipedia is not a reliable source. That's something that we pretend uh, in certain cases. Yeah, dress code, Beck, good example. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in dress code, you can think of dress code in different ways, right? I mean, uh, now, I mean, at UMW, of course, we have, you know, you know we need to wear a mask, um, but uh, there's also different ways in which we dress ourselves in order to appear to certain audiences um, the way that we want to appear. Uh, like some schools insist that everyone dresses the same, but like, I don't think any of us would disagree with the statement that what you wear has, will affect people's impressions of you. So yeah, no short shorts, sir. Um, and uh, certainly as a professor, I, you know, I think a lot about what I wear in terms of looking, you know, competent and professional to some extent. Um, yeah, sure, no phones in class. These are rules, right? Um, so, but these are, let's think about how these are rules that are, have, have a game-like structure. In other words, how are these special rules? And uh, to go back to Maddie's statement about grading systems, um, these set boundaries around what you can and can't do, uh, certainly like cheating or the honor, honor violations, that's a set of rules that if you violate it, you are no longer playing by the, the, the rules. Um, and so therefore you're, you're punished in the context of, that, of the, the game of school by being excluded from it, right? Or punished, uh, you know, penalized in terms of a grade. Yeah, if you follow the rules, good grades, these are successes. But the idea that that's successful, I like how you put that in square, scare quotes, Maddie, like, it's a very constrained and arbitrary sense of success, right? It's it's an A or a B or a C, but like that's a, like A's and B's and C's aren't real things. Like those aren't, like those are the only things that make sense in the context of a, a class, but then in the context of a, a transcript, right? I mean, these are things that only uh, work outside of that. So yeah, good, good uh, ideas. So, um, okay. So let's see. Yeah, good points. Let me see if I oh, lost my windows. Oh yeah, and it is also like leveling up. I think you're you're applying, um, uh, Maddie. Like you graduate from you know K twelve to uh, you know university to.
graduate school to professional school, whatever. Like you, you work your way up level by level. And you also build stats, right? You build your transcripts and your GPA. These are stats that indicate your level of progress. Um, you know, you may have taken some, there are certain classes, uh, Ron Zaharsky at UMW does this where um, you get, you earn points that are like, it's like a gamified thing, like different assignments are worth different point values and you try to work your points up in certain areas, I think. And then like, that's what determines your final grade. They are final bosses, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, they are the final, it's the threshold, right? And, and I think, uh, you know, as you're like, one way to think of it is, in, in, you know, in the, with the final boss analogy is like, this is, um, you know, I'm hopefully your, your guide on that quest to uh, uh, defeat that boss. Uh, hopefully you can see me as the guide and not as the boss that you have to defeat. <laughs> you know, these are things that... Um, that we can do, right? Um, yeah, so, okay, good. And I think this is pr fairly intuitive. Um, so this is, this is good. I'm glad you all are picking this up as well. Um, okay, so let's look at some other people. So, um, and, you know, um, there's a lot more to say about uh, um, Hoisinger, by the way. I think I've uploaded a PDF of his whole book if you want to take a look at it, uh, at least, or maybe just an excerpt from it in Canvas, um, if you want to. So let's move on a little bit uh, uh, to kind of uh, Roger Kaiwa, who kind of saw himself as the successor to Johan Huizinga and um, saw his work as building off of uh, Huizinga's and making it more complicated and, and nuanced and adding several uh, new keywords and things for us to learn and think about as we kind of go through it. Um, the, uh, yeah. uh, so he gives us lots of work, like, you know, long definitions. It's uh, the... Um, the title of his book is Man, Play, and Games. And so he's, again, kind of working in that anthropological sense of like understanding humans and what's, you know, what's their deal. Uh, so he gives us these things. Um, play must be free. It must be separate. It must be uncertain. Um, this is just, I'm quoting from his book. It must be unproductive. It must be governed by rules. It must be make-believe. And these are all things that he's saying as, you know, essentially he's elaborating on the magic circle idea. Like these are all the different characteristics that the magic circle has uh, that, you know, make it distinct from everything else from the real world. And, the, and running through all this, hopefully you're seeing how there's this idea of a real world and this idea of a game world. And it's understanding the difference between those that, that we're talking about and whether or not um, values and meanings can pass through that barrier between the game world and the real world can be really important to think about. And that's one of the things that you'll see here as a structure this this formalizing of video games has a tendency or of games in general has a tendency to close off the idea or imagine a closed off idea of the game um, but i think one criticism of the formalist approach which is what i'm summarizing today is that we never stop being who we really are and uh, when we enter into these magic circles like we don't become someone else we pretend to be someone else but our real self is always still there in ways that has all kinds of cultural contexts and things that we can't ever get away from. And so it's, it's a little bit misleading to think of a, a game as a purely formal structure, uh, but I think there's still a lot of useful ways to talk about differences within games using that formal structure. So, um, yeah, I mean, these are essentially, he's just he's spelling out the same idea um, that uh, um, has started with. Um, so he gives us uh, several, like, you know, it's nice to have, um, special names for things and lists, right? It's things that you can uh, ask about on a test later, although I don't have tests, so don't, you know, don't worry. But I might ask you about to, to reflect on some of these terms at the end of the week. Um, so he characterizes four different kinds of games. So these are the character, character, characteristics of play. The play has to be free, separate, uncertain, unproductive, governed by rules, and make-believe. Uh, and then he characterizes four different kinds of games, and these are games, uh, I mean, games may have elements of more than one of these four things, but he says all of them have at least, every game is at least one of these. Um, Aegon, Aaliyah, Mimicry, and Illinks. And these are, uh, I think, fairly intuitive, but I thought it was, it, it, you know, um, Kaiwa is not talking about video games, right? I mean, it, I, I put their years um, so you could kind of get a sense of their time frame of when they're writing these ideas. And Kaiwa is definitely not talking about video games because they don't really exist when he's writing. Um, so. Um, this book, I believe, was from the 1960s is when he published this book. Um, I don't have the date on the book itself, but, um, it, you know, the point is we have to do some work to try to apply his ideas to video games. So this is kind of what I threw together um, in terms of these things. Um, Aegon or Agon, this is, um, you know, competitive gameplay, right? So there's, there's plenty of examples 
of gameplay. This is Apex Legends, a battle royale kind of game for first shooter running around shooting. Um, you win so that other people lose, and uh, you know, back and forth, right? It's a what an econ economist would call like a zero sum kind of game, and most of these are where. Um, you, there can be only one winner, and uh, one person winning means that someone necessarily has to lose, and you know that's it, right? You are you usually in the context of Aegon using Kaiwa's terminology. We're usually talking about com um, competitive games based on skill, so the most skillful player wins, um, but not necessarily. There could be other ways in which you compete, but that's that's the basic idea. Um, next, let me see. How do I go? Here we go. Um, so Aaliyah, uh, it means chance. So uh, aleatory games are games that involve, um, you know, chance <laughs> in, in some significant way, as opposed to agonistic games, which require mostly c competition. Um, aleatory games. Uh, I just have Tetris here. Um, Tetris is a game very much controlled by chance in terms of what blocks you get, but of course there's also skill. Um, you know, it's not just chance. It's not just rolling dice and seeing who has the highest number, but actually, you know, doing things based on it. But uh, the the randomness the random choice of which brick which tetromino you get next uh, makes a big difference in your success and so you have to you know be hope uh, you have to be skillful but you also have to be lucky and that idea of being lucky means that we're talking about an aleatory kind of uh, composition right uh, yeah and, and poker right so poker is uh, Kelly's pointed out in there is also very much an aleatory game very chance based there's skill involved once you get your your deck but um, what options are available to you in terms of how to deploy your skill uh, will will vary a lot depending on your actual your hand. So yeah, poker is a good example of an aleatory game. Um, so mimicry means that we're trying to simulate something, we're trying to be someone, and th and this would include I have a farming simulator here just because I think just the idea of this game is kind of amusing to me. Um, I've never played this game. I could sort of see the appeal, um, but also it does seem sort of silly, which is that you. Um, or at least supposed to have a bigger header. You know, you drive a tractor. I, I think you also kind of manage your farm and do other stuff too. Uh, but the idea is that you're pretending that you are a farmer as you play this game, and that pretense takes on two different, two different vectors at least. One is simulating the processes of like growing and harvesting crops and like managing the machinery. So there's kind of a process-based simulation there. But there's also kind of the, the play acting of like, I'm pretending I'm a farmer. And uh, you may or may not participate as much in that aspect of it, but it's implied by the game. Um, but this kind of mi mimicry as a kind of game would also include like uh, dressing up at Halloween. Like you pretend to be a vampire. And so that's, you know, why you get candy. So like these are, uh, mimicry includes that kind of playing as well. Um, and finally, uh, well, there we go. Uh, Elinx is just um, the kind of uh, play that just is like having fun and just kind of the exhilaration of experiencing something uh, different than your everyday life. And um, uh, so it, that's a good question, Maddie. I think, um, yeah, I guess so, right? Because you, you play as the character, uh, I can't, I'm not sure I can do the French pronunciation, but Passaport 2. Uh, you, you play as him and then you are pretending to be him in the choices that you make. So you, uh, I mean, you could play against the grain, but if you're playing it to try to be consistent with the goals of the game, you're trying to be the, make the best decisions that he would make. And so you, your decisions are vicariously passport to his decisions. Um, you could play it against him, but you would, or like try to intentionally make bad decisions. Um, so that's not necessarily the core, you know, that's, but that's kind of breaking the rules of that game in that sense, if that makes sense. So to play 80 days faithfully would be to embrace the mimicry aspect of it, I suppose. Yeah. That's just a quick off the top of my head answer. I might have more detailed thoughts later, uh, but good question. Um, but this one, just in terms of, just to show you an example of, um, kind of the Illink's idea of play. This is a game called, ah, uh, I can't pronounce that right. A Reckless Disregard for Gravity. I always forget how many A's are in the game. It's just a really fun game. I don't know. It's, it, there's, it's, a, it's funny, but it's also just kind of like the basic game mechanic is just, it's a funny idea, but it's also just really fun to play. You just, there's literally, you're, you're base jumping, like you fall. And so you have to fall and steer yourself through different buildings and superstructures. Try to make points and try not to splat. Play, try not to hit anything because you will die instantly. Um, so just the, but just like the play of it has this kind of roller coaster feel to it. That's really, it can. It's really fun. I just I enjoy this game. So the, but it was the first example that came to mind when I was thinking of this kind of play or this kind of um, this kind of game from Kawa's definitions. Um, can you all think of more? I mean, this is. Uh, I don't have a slide for this question, but can you think of any others 
in that context of, uh, you know, or do you have any questions about games that you've been playing in terms of figuring out which kind of game play from Kaiwa's definition they fit into? All right, feel free to pose those in there. Uh, but one more set of concepts from Kaiwa, and <laughs> he's, he's got plenty, but these are a couple more. Um, one of the things he distinguishes from, in addition to those you know, six or seven uh, definitions of play and then uh, four different types of games, he's also distinguishing between two very even broader types of play. I and mean, he calls one ludus and the other paideia. Um, and ludus has to do with structured play. Uh, paideia has to do with freedom in play. So this isn't even talking about specific games, but the kinds of things you do as you play these different games. So some examples. Uh, um, by comparison, uh, field hockey is a game with structure, with rules, uh, as opposed to Calvin Ball, which maybe hopefully you know from the comic Calvin and Hobbes, where the rules change constantly. Um, so that's a game where they're, it's Paideia, that's a game that, Calvin Ball is a game that emphasizes Paideia because it is Calvin and Hobbes just sort of goofing around, but also arguing over the rules, and it's really kind of a meta game. Um, but for um, but field hockey is a game with you know lots of rules. Um, I mentioned that because um, you know my daughters have you know last year they started playing field hockey on the recreational team, and I, I found it took me a while to get the rules of field hockey. Like I get the basic idea of you're trying to get the ball in the goal, like that's you know fine, um, and things like the sticking. But I all the very often I uh, and I still struggle when I watch is like uh, you know the referee blows a whistle and. I don't know why, like, I don't know what happens. And so it takes me a while to figure out what what kinds of things are allowed and what kinds of things aren't. And I'm still struggling with it. Um, but I asked my, you know, my sister-in-law who was, a, she, she played at the college level and she was, and she was like, yeah, I don't know a lot of times either. So I just stop whenever the whistle blows. So um, it's a game with a lot of rules and that's fine, but it's just, as opposed to Calvin Ball, you know, there's not as many. Another example, uh, chess, obviously very structured, um, but improv theater, like that's a kind of play that has, conventions and, and communities and rules and cultures, but it's also, it's it's defined by being unpredictable and open-ended. So uh, very much emphasizing Paideia compared with uh, Ludus. Um, and then another, just, you know, other examples like running a race, right? Like running is fun. Um, you can do it on your own. Uh, but when you run a race, you agree that your race starts here and ends there and you um, start at a specific time. You all, you run against other people, right? There's a, a, a lot of structure that you add to that versus running to make your flight go up, your, your kite fly up or just running for fun. Um, that's going to be a much more open-ended Paideia kind of game. There's no purpose to it. There's no sense of a winner. It's just, there we go, right? We're just having fun. Um, okay, good. So uh, true American, what is that? <laughs> Yeah, field hockey does look like fun, Maddie. I, I, I thought you might play, but it's uh, it's um, it's challenging as a viewer to understand what's going on. Um, is True American a? Oh, okay. I don't know that. Game. I don't know that show. So, <laughs> um, but I I believe you if it if it makes sense. If it's a chaotic kind of game, then yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so uh, Meg agrees. So good. Uh, another um, point in favor of that. Uh, okay, good. So really, Ludus and Paideia is probably, uh, yeah, among Kaiwa's contributions to this conversation, this distinction is probably his most influential. So thinking about Ludus versus Paideia as two ways of talking about what we do when we play um, or how we play, this is, this is what we're, this is the main takeaway from Kaiwa. Okay, let's look somewhere else. I was actually, I was pretty surprised actually that McLuhan showed up in this chapter. Um, Marshall McLuhan is sort of a, uh, uh, sort of a weird guy. I, I, I say weird, but it's just, um, he's, his work is widely cited and referred to. Um, his famous aphorism was that the medium is the message, but I find McLuhan hard to work with. I, I find him rather slippery. So things like, like he'll say things like that sound really profound, like the medium is the message. But then it's like, what do you actually mean by that? And you can find quotes that sound really juicy and interesting, and then you find other quotes that seem to contradict what you thought he was saying earlier. Um, he has a rather uh, inexact way of writing sometimes, and, and it's hard to really get your hands around McLuhan, I think. Um, and that, that, you know, that means that you can kind of use McLuhan to say whatever you want to say, basically, is what I've found uh, in terms of people using him. Um, but, I mean, his, he was very influential in terms of getting us to think about media seriously, and he means media in a pretty literal sense. So not, um, 
not like uh, like comics as a medium, but like paper as a medium. Um, and one of his famous essays has to do with uh, electricity as a medium and thinking about how that the things that electricity carries are only possible because electricity exists. So how does electricity exist? How does it get to our houses? Um, that's the meaning of the content that we see on the, the TV. Which, you know, one of those things that sounds provocative and it's like, huh, I never thought of it that way. But then like, okay, then what do we do with that? Like, how do we, how do we make some sense of that? Um, I, you know, I'm really interested in a lot of what he has to say. Like he talks about American and versus British politics. And he talks about how um, Britain is a, a nation of both Britain and America. We have, you know, con uh, constitutions, right? But um, uh, in, in Britain's constitution, Great Britain's England's constitution, like evolved and it has it evolved from an oral tradition originally according to McLuhan and as opposed to America's where we kind of started by writing things down so he says America is a like a typographic nation because we are focused on print and valorizing the meaning of print and like and we think of like the Supreme Court as the ultimate arbiters of what these words mean and so we're all kind of focused on that as a as a culture like um, which I think is, is really interesting it's sort of hard to prove or disprove but it's like okay yeah um, so uh, there were a couple of, I never really looked at his comments on games and it does seem kind of uh, almost an aside within his book, uh, The Medium is a Message, uh, or under, Understanding Media is where this one comes from. Um, and he's put a claim here and I, I'm kind of interested in this. I, the authors of the textbook sort of note that you, like this seems intriguing, but kind of like I'm saying, it seems intriguing, but they're not sure what else to do with it. Um, he says baseball. And this, these are quotes from him. This is the elegant abstract image of an industrial society living by split second timing. So thinking about baseball as essentially a metaphor for industrial, uh, for uh, a metaphor for a society organized around industrialization. Um, that's really interesting. So baseball um, comes to be, become uh, the American pastime, the, the major sport in America in the 19th century, which also was the industrial revolution. So how you know he's trying to put these two things together which i think seems intriguing it seems <laughs> interesting but like how do you understand like like how does that how does that actually work that's still, still the question um so yeah that, so that, that's a good point right so yeah so thanks um colin that's a, that's a uh, more nuanced explanation than what i gave uh, just now so that's what he's um that's that was basically um that was basically McLuhan's point. Yeah, so thanks. Uh, but then, I mean, that was his explanation of the Britain, Britain system, but then the contrast with America's typographic system, as he says, that's the, you know, that was McLuhan's. Uh, anyway, so then uh, he talked about football. And of course, you remember, um, you know, looking at the years, McLuhan is writing this in the 1960s. So that's the kind of rise of football as the, like American football as the pastime or the sport that we kind of identify as an American sport. Um, and now he's thinking about, for him, he says it's non-positional. Any or all players can switch it to any role during play. Um, certainly, I guess there are rules as far as like being like a downfield receiver and eligible and stuff like that. But basically, your players move around and they do whatever they perceive needs to be done within the, the scope of their role. Um, and he says it agrees very well with the new needs of the de decentralized team play in the electric age. That's the part I'm not sure what he means by that. Uh, I don't know what he means by decentralized team play, like as a as a cultural organization. So. I'm not sure there, but if I was thinking, I was thinking about like, if we try to do what McLuhan was, I think trying to do there uh, today, what does something like the battle royale game genre tell us about contemporary culture? Um, so just to kind of go back a little bit with McLuhan, his whole idea is that the games a culture plays tells us everything we need to know, to know about that culture. Um, right now, many people in our culture play battle royale style games like Fortnite. Uh, I mean, of course, they play lots of other things, and not everyone plays those things, but it's just honestly um, kind of an arbitrary example. But if we took Battle Royale as kind of the emblematic game of our culture right now, what would that say about our culture? And the sense in which it can say things could be metaphorical, like McLuhan kind of does with baseball, or it could be something else. So what do you think? Okay, sure. Um, that's kind of what I was thinking too. So Colin's point is that our culture has an emphasis on the individual versus everybody, right? So the individual um, kind of taking on the world, right? Um, I would almost call that the American mythology, like the, the American exceptionalism mythology. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
And it looks like Jack is typing to you. Or somebody just agreed with, with uh, Colin. <laughs> Destroy those below you. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, could be a way of talking about a battle royale kind of game or uh, like capitalism. Right? Um, we see these kind of debates or that, that kind of terminology used right now in debates about the minimum wage and stuff. <clears throat> so it's not so much about kind of us ascending the pyramid, but making sure that the people below us stay below us. That's that's one critique of people's complaints about the, the minimum wage uh, rising. So, yeah, that's interesting. Any other, any other thoughts? I don't see anyone else typing, so maybe not. I mean, I, and I think you're... I mean, those are the things I would have said, so I think that's good. Uh, Jack and Colin, maybe we could just move on because uh, I want to try to wrap up around 11 if I can. So, um, I, I mean, we can also do the same thing to look at first-person shooters, right? I mean, just the idea of... I mean, I, I mentioned Battle Royale. Many of those are first-person shooters as well, so that also might have symbolic, metaphorical kind of uh, interpretations. Um, Alexander Galloway kind of did that reading of first-person shooters um, in his book about the... Um, what was the title of the... I think the title of his book was First Person Colon A Philosophy of Games or something like that. But he, he spends a lot of time thinking about the meaning of the first person shooter as a, uh, a genre. And then he has another essay about real time strategies. Uh, yeah, Alexander Galloway, Alexander Galloway, shout out to that book. <laughs> anyway, um, let's move on a few more. Um, these are the, the next few are going to be a little bit shorter because these are, I'm really just kind of bouncing along the surface of some of the items from the book. Uh, meta communication. This is Bates, and he's talking about this idea that we communicate, that we are communicating in a certain way in a play, and that's a kind of play that we can do. Um, we learn about um, how to do things by playing at doing the thing first, and uh, that has uh, that makes sense kind of developmentally. Um, I you know I get that, uh, and this is I'm just this is literally just a quote from the textbook. I couldn't find a, an actual quote from Bates in that summarize this very well. So um, essentially just saying that we come to figure these things out through play, uh, really kind of extending, um, extending Hoisinger's ideas into the realm of psychology, I think is probably what I would, how I would characterize that. Um, this is also an interesting one. This is Bernard Suits, um, and his idea has to do with efficiency. And this is kind of a quirky definition. That's why I thought I'd include it um, directly here. It's this idea that when we think about what a game is, it's a uh, less efficient way of doing something. Like it's a, a decision to do something in a, a way that's unnecessary. Like there's some, and this is um, maybe a different way of putting one of the points that, that Kaiwa made, that the, a game is not, a game is optional. Like you don't have to do it. And that's one of the key things here. And another way of thinking about it being optional meaning, may mean that it's potentially a waste of time. Um, and that's, I think, what Bernard Suits' definition underscores. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's one of uh, one way to think about it. Uh, I don't have time to go into that or unpack that very much. Uh, another thinker um, that is really influential, um, died somewhat more recently, is looking at um, you know this is a this is the best the, the clearest quote I could find from Brian Sutton Smith, but he wrote quite extensively about play and its meanings and its different contexts. Um, but you know this is a succinct definition as I think we found, which is that it's uh, voluntary, and we've got we've got several of the elements from Kaiwa kind of built into this, right? So we've got voluntary, we've got we've got some kind of system, that we've got oppositions, we've got confinements, we've got processes, we've got rules, and then there's a dis disequilibrial outcome. I like that word, uh, meaning that there's a winner and a loser, uh, or you know first place, second place, or whatever there needs to be, right? So these are the ideas. Um, yeah, and that's a good point, Kelly. Like if it's if it's enjoyment, it's not really a waste. Um, it's hard to call that, but it's a kind of voluntary inefficiency. Like it's doing it the hard way because you enjoy the hard way, um, and uh, or you, maybe you are kind of. I mean, you're not you're not working basically. You're not um, unless you're like an esports celebrity or something. Playing a video game is not your job. Like you're not getting compensated in the the labor sense. So maybe so maybe that's what Bernard Suits means a little bit there. Is like it's not. Um, uh, labor where the value of the labor can be extracted and then um, you're, you're being alienated from it by capitalism. So I don't know, I'm not sure if, if Bernard Suits is a, a Marxist, but that I think there is probably a Marxist interpretation of that, which is kind of leading off of Jack's comment <laughs> there. Uh, anyway, so let's do a few more. Right, well actually no, this is, this is it, this is wrapping it up. So ultimately this is, a, this is a rhetorical question first and then I have an actual question, uh, which is where does all this formalism get us? What difference does it make? And I think you know, we've got lots of new words in this lecture, ludus paideia, 
uh, Magic Circle, um, Agon, Ilya, um, Agon, Ilya, Lynx, and what was the other one? Um, the uh, Mimicry. So um, this is, so we have all these new terms. We have some pretty rigorous philosophical concepts. I mean, I'm just summarizing these here, but you've got whole books for most of these, especially um, uh, Jan Huizenga and, um, and Roger Carrois. And these, you know, I'm just giving you kind of the high level, the, the high view of these things. They've got extensive examples and explanations of these things, right? So um, the question is like, what do we do with this? Like, what is the meaning and value of this kind of thinking for us as we try to take, as we try to take video games seriously in this class? Um, so I think there are some things to, to think about. Like whenever we, to go back to my original, one of my earlier slides, I posed the question or I, I made the claim that we're talking about boundaries when we talk about definitions. We're saying um, these are the games and these are not the games. Um, so what is getting left out? Uh, how do we, you know, how do we negotiate the difference, the, that line between these two? Uh, but also who's getting left out of this conversation? Um, I was... I wasn't planning to make this a big theme in this lecture, but I, I couldn't help but notice a, a, a theme in the examples that I talked about today. Did you notice any themes among the theorists that I was talking about uh, today so far? And this is an actual question. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Kelly's got it. Um, they were all men. Uh, and <sighs> Maddie's typing. Maybe she's saying the same thing. Yeah, they are. And so I was really struck by that l looking at it today. Uh, it's something that, like, I, I'm not here to deny the influence of Johan Huizinga or Roger Kaiwa, especially. Um, but it is interesting that, I mean, there are certainly women. Maybe there are fewer, but, you know, their voices aren't represented in this textbook. They aren't showing up there except as kind of side notes. Um, yeah, and as you say, man the player, right? I mean, that's the, um, you're kind of referencing the old fashioned kind of uh, gendered way of talking about humanity as man or mankind. And I, I put a sick mark on a couple of those uh, throughout the slides here to show that that's not how we would use that pronoun today, right? And we do, we do try to not use that pronoun generically like that anymore. Um, but the, um, or not pronoun, but you know what I mean. Uh, gender term. Yeah, it is, it is interesting. And I, I uh, have to find the quote, actually, because there was actually the only... So women do show up. Uh, I mean, two of the authors of this textbook are women. Like, it's definitely... Definitely women exist. Um, they don't mention Marie Law Ryan in this book, but it is interesting, or at least in this chapter, but it is interesting, especially when we look at the ludology versus narratology argument and I don't have enough evidence to say this other than a very sweeping generalization, but it does seem that there's something, um, I don't know, I hesitate to say it because it's gonna sound awkward, but um, it does seem like more often when we're looking at people on the narrative side or the narratology side, there are more women on that side than on the ludology side. So there is a, in a sense, there is in a sense, a bit of, um, uh, I almost, I almost want to say macho kind of attitude to the ludology side. Um, and I, I'm not sure what that means or, or what else to do with that, but it's something that I've noticed and certainly I think other people have critiqued as well. Um, I mean, there was a moment where I'm trying to find here in the textbook. I've got it in this book, so let me see if I can find it. Um, yeah, so looking at page 35 of the textbook, and this is interesting where in talking about Kind of how people have used the magic circle or not and so she's talking about i mean the textbook here is talking about um certainly we see it influencing chris crawford um and katie salen eric zimmerman um, we looked at their rules earlier uh, in terms of when we're doing that dynamic systems kind of analysis of gameplay um so they were definitely they were building their ideas off of hoisinga like they definitely are taking for granted a lot of the things that i talked about today i kind of gave it to you backwards but that's you know that's the idea um, but then when they talk about exceptions to this, right, I think it's interesting that the exceptions that they mention are like Mia Consalvo, um, T.L. Taylor, Constance Steinkuhler, um, I would also have Marie Law Ryan and Janet Murray um, to people, to the list of people who have thought of different ways to think about the magic circle or to think of that 
as less of a discrete barrier and more of as a continuum uh, that we kind of become and, and kind of go across gradually in different ways for different reasons. Um, but I think it's really interesting that that's where if we're looking at, you know, and this is not the best way to do a, a meta study of, uh, of or a literature survey at all, but if we look at where women are, they often show up in these footnotes like that as kind of the, um, the other point of view that's not fully represented in this chapter. Um, it's not just that they're women, but they ha that they seem to be better represented on better represented better represented on the narrativist side of things. So yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why that is. Um, okay. So any, I'm going to wrap it up pretty soon. So do you have any more questions or comments on this, or any questions about what to do next? I do plan on doing another lecture at 1:30. Um, that's uh, that seemed like a good time the other day to do a discussion, but I wanted to do a lecture as opposed to a discussion because I wanted to give you some key terms and do some more explaining of things. And I, I just I figured a lecture is the best way to do that because um, I can record that and then other people can watch it later if they need to. But um, is 1.30 good for you all? Is very good for another lecture. Okay, cool. Um, hopefully shorter. Um, I, I'm really, I'm not gonna be able to get down into the, uh, uh, the trenches with it, but um, Ryan, you don't need to, but you could certainly tr start it, right? So Ryan asks, is, is, do we need to do anything beforehand? Um, I would recommend two things. If you did not do the, if you haven't added to the reading discussion that I posted yesterday, then you could certainly do that. Or you could go ahead and look at the two essays that I've put into the uh, into Canvas as uh, that I'd like for you to respond to sometime today. So you could start looking at those if you want. I think um, they may be a little, a little bit easier to navigate after my lecture, um, but you could certainly start looking at them now and see if they make sense. Um, a couple of things that, like, so Esmond Arseth's essay that I'm going to give you is, it's a standalone article, but it was part of a collection, and so there is a bit of dialogue in the in that. He's, in other words, he's talking to some of his co-writers in that collection, um, but it pretty much stands on its own, and you can read it and understand it very well, I think. Um, the and he represents the ludology point of view. Uh, the other selection is a, uh, a chapter from a book, and uh, I think it does stand on its own pretty well within that. Uh, but it is part of a book, and so there are some ideas that Marie La Ryan may refer to that were part of other chapters in that book, which you don't have. So, um, I guess bear that in mind as you look at it. But I think it does pretty much stand on. I think it does a good job of standing on its own as well. So I think that's why I, I selected it as kind of the representative uh, narrativist point of view uh, for talking about the debate. Uh, but yeah, those links are in the module page for today, and I'll add them to the discussion page. Uh, for the, the reading um, reading journal for today, too. Okay, so cool. Well, I'm going to wrap up the stream uh, and, of course, put this on YouTube later, and I'll continue to add notes and update the schedule for the week as soon as I kind of figure things out. A couple things just to maybe briefly mention the roadmap of what we're going to do. We're going to talk about metagaming. Uh, metagaming is uh, kind of the, the project, but if we're thinking about the history of video game studies, there's an important in-between stage um, that I'd like to think of, which is the... Uh, so we have the, kind of the ludology narratology debate is sort of um, the early days of the discipline. The next phase is what I would think of as the material turn uh, or the turn towards materialism. And that's implement, that's mostly captured in the fields of platform studies and ar uh, media archaeology. And so I would, do you want to talk about those two? And then also uh, and then that's, that kind of gets us to metagaming uh, as a thing. And metagaming, I'm mainly looking at metagaming through that one, the one book. I mean, it's, it's a book by uh, 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 Patrick Lemieux and Stephanie Bollock, and um, I just think it's really brilliant. So I think it's going to have a lot to do as far as influencing the next level or the next stage of video game studies. So um, I'm pleased to bring it to you and introduce it to you all. Um, and uh, I might even be able to get them in to uh, guest lecture or do a brief Q&A uh, at some point. Um, Maybe. I don't know if I'm going to have time. But anyway, if I do have time, I might see if they're available. Uh, anyway, so thanks for watching the stream today. And um, I will see you again at 1.30 for another one. But hopefully hopefully brief. I'll, I will try my best to keep it brief um, and uh, introduce some things. All right. See you all later. Have a good lunch break or whatever else you do between now and then. Bye.